And uh, as he was loading my uh, bags, he asked me, what do, you, what do you do or why are you in Edinburgh? So I said, I'm coming to the book festival. I, I write books. And he said, oh, what sort of books? And luckily, uh, it's much easier to answer these days because I said, have you ever heard of a TV show called Outlander? <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, yes, that's just massive. I'm a huge fan. And I said, well, that's good because I wrote the books that's based on. And he <laughs> stopped driving, turned around and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely um, to see you all. <laughs> Before we start talking about the books, this book and the, and the TV, mm -hmm. um, can I just go back a bit to your 20s, when I know you were a kind of science writer and you were writing computer software stuff mm -hmm. and uh, a whole range of things. Um, but I also have discovered, and I didn't know this for a while, uh, that your first fiction writing was not this, was not Outlander, as you've no. always claimed. <laughs> no, it was not. It was, in fact, <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Can you say a little bit about that? <laughs> about well, the fact this was Disney Comics, obviously. Well, yes, it was. Uh, well, uh, my mother taught me to read when I was about three, uh, in part by reading me uh, Disney Comics. And I never stopped. So at the age of 27, I was uh, sitting in the parking lot of a Circle K reading a comic book that I had just purchased with my Diet Coke. And I was thinking, well, this is pretty bad. I bet I could do better myself. So seized by whatever impulse, I um, found out the name of the uh, editor who managed that particular line of comics. And I wrote him this very rude letter <laughs> and said, uh, dear sir, I uh, have been reading your comics for 25 years. They've been getting worse and worse. I said, <laughs> I'm not sure I could do better myself, but I'd like to try. Well, luckily, I had uh, reached an editor named Dull Connell, who was a real gentleman and uh, had a sense of humor, luckily. And he wrote back to me and said, OK, try. And he enclosed uh, the guidelines for writing a Disney comic, uh, which vary somewhat. And uh, also, he sent me a sample, a sheet, so I could see how you submit a comic script. You line it out with a ruler and, uh, so, and back in the day. So it actually has little panels like it does on the page. And then in each panel, you put a few lines of description as to what is going on in this panel, which characters are there and what are they doing. And then under that, you put the dialogue as to, uh, you know, Donald says this and so forth. And then basic rule of thumb, you don't want the speech balloons to be so big that there is no room for the art. So you keep the dialogue very short. And uh, so with that in hand, I wrote my first story. Uh, he did not buy it, but he did something much more useful. He told me what was wrong with it. He did buy my second story, and I continued to write for him for several years until, um, until they stopped publishing <laughs> that line of comic books, at which point he uh, gave me an introduction to the foreign comics division, and I wrote for Tom Goldberg in the foreign comics division for several years until they also stopped publishing uh, comics. Uh, and that was kind of the end of my comics career. <laughs> Well, you say, you say that, but I believe you were offered, uh, Marvel were interested in, in your writing for them. Were they, were well, they yes, Marvel they were. Mm -hmm. It was either Marvel or DC. Yes, they did uh, at one point write to me to ask if I would be interested in writing for them. And I said, no. I said, uh, I, I don't have a feel, you know, for, for your characters. I, uh, you know, I have no problem, whatever, in uh, feeling that Donald Duck is real, but I don't feel that way about <laughs> Superman. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I declined their offer. <laughs> <laughs> and has, would you say that Scrooge McDuck has somehow made its way into the Outlander series, or not really? Uh, no, I haven't found a good place for him yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've sold millions all over the world, 50 million. You, you About that, yes. Yeah, you, you've published in 35 countries and mm. 28 languages. A lot. Uh, yeah. A lot, a, a lot of countries. What do you think it is that, that has that universal appeal for the stories that you produce? Uh, well, it may be that I feel, I feel these people are real, and uh, evidently so do you. <laughs> but uh, evidently that's something that translates, and uh, people are interested in, in you know, stories that involve uh, you know, both drama and dramatic circumstances and possibly a little bit of the supernatural, but mostly they're interested just in, in people be, being human. And, uh, 
apparently I can do that. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm very pleased that it does translate. Um, though looking at some of the books, I can't help but think they <laughs> didn't translate much of it. It varies from country to country, but the first, uh, first Italian publisher we had sent me a copy of what purported to be Outlander. It was about that thick, <laughs> and it had a picture on the cover of a very Italianate and very abundantly endowed a young woman in a peasant dress and skirt, uh, splayed on the grass in an inviting <laughs> position. <laughs> and the title was Ovunque Nel Tempo, and I have no idea what that means. One of my friends translated it as never without an egg timer. <laughs> um, anyway, that didn't last long. And luckily we found a new Italian publisher who put it out better. I think we're now on our fourth Italian publisher who has just uh, reissued the entire series in lavishly beautiful uh, dual volumes. Up to this point, uh, they had been doing it all in one volume, but uh, the new publisher said, no, there's not room you know, uh, we, we need two because it expands in the translation. Of course. And normally what they would do is just cut out, cut out chunks of it to make it fit. And he said, no, we're not doing that. And so now it is in volume one and volume two, each with its own individual beautiful cover. So we're very happy with Italy at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, your, your, your titles are, are magnificent, this one well, thank you. especially. But I, I, and I know it's a familiar story, but I mean, the, the first one was not originally called Outlander, was it? You had oh, a no. different idea. Yeah, uh, I called the first one Cross Stitch, which uh, some of you will know because that's still the title it has in, in the UK. Though I think since the TV show, they have begun retitling it as Outlander, so it will match. Uh, when I arrived yesterday morning quite early, I finally found my, uh, my driver, and uh, as he was loading my uh, bags, he asked me, what do, you, what do you do or why are you in Edinburgh? So I said, I'm going to the book festival, I, I write books. And he said, oh, what sort of books? And luckily, uh, it's much easier to answer these days because I said, have you ever heard of a TV show called Outlander? <laughs> and uh, they said, oh yes, that's just massive, I'm a huge fan. And I said, well, that's good because I wrote the books that's based on. And he <laughs> stopped driving, turned around and said, no. <laughs> 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 Well, that was, you know, a very good introduction. You know? I'm, I'm glad at least he stopped driving before yeah, he turned right. <laughs> now, when you were last here, which was 2014, when I was privileged yeah. to, to interview you then, um, the TV series had just come out. Yeah, just well, its first... Uh, I think it had already been screened, so it wasn't quite an unknown factor in yeah, terms of popularity, yeah. was it? Mm -hmm. It was being very popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and since then, you've had zillions of fans. And, and I was just asking so. you just before we came on, the, the ladies of... <laughs> the ladies of Lollybrock, yes. Were they the first one? Are there any ladies of Lollybrock here? No? no? no. Well, you need to join them. Look them, <laughs> look, look them up online when you get out of here. <laughs> yeah, they were sort of my first official fan group. And in fact, they began in Canada and Vancouver. And uh, they are still thriving throughout Canada, though there are quite a number of them in the US as well. But evidently, they have not quite yet spread to the British Isles. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, when you did first start, um, you, you'd not been to Scotland, I, I believe. I had not, You yeah. did all as, re as research in mm -hmm. the library, because you were a very good researcher, of course. Well, that's why I chose historical fiction. I had always wanted to be a writer and to write novels, but, you know, it's not an easily marked career path. You can't go to, well, I mean, you can take classes in how to write a novel, but it will not actually teach you how to write a novel. That's the problem with how to write books, is they don't actually teach you how to write. The only thing that will do that is the act of writing. Now, mind you, how to write books can suggest interesting things to you, can cause you to, you know, maybe think of trying this or that that you hadn't thought of before. They might make things easier for you. Uh, they might educate you in small things like grammar. Uh, some people say, oh, these picky little things like grammar, you know. <laughs> some people think that uh, they don't need to worry about grammar or punctuation or anything like that because they will just scribble down the story and then sell it and an editor will take care of all the little picky things. <laughs> I'm sort of going, no, that's not how it works. Um, 
now I've lost my train of thought. No, don't worry. It'll come but, back. <laughs> but, but you also, you also <laughs> delight in using, in using <laughs> wonderful words but that most of us don't know what they are. And, you've, and you have at the end of your, <laughs> of your books, as in this one, the words that, that you need to explain oh, yes. to people what they are. Uh -huh. No, that's true. Um, I have author's notes at the ends of my books, partly to identify you know, strange words and also in an effort to keep people from writing to tell me that this or that is a typographical error when in fact it is Scots. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you have a family tree at the start and indeed at the end, which is becoming more uh, the outlander oh, family yeah. tree, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the genealogy is expanding at a rapid rate. Um, there's not, well, is there? There is a there's genealogy. There's one, one at the end, one. yeah. Yeah, this is the first book I think that has, no, it's the second one, uh, because we had to expand it. Uh, Written in My Own Heart's Blood was the first to have actually family tree and genealogy in the front. And it was so popular that the publisher said, well, we want to do it again for this book, but you have a lot of new characters. <laughs> and I said, yes, all right. So uh, we expanded it, and now it's you know, both inner and outer covers. And uh, then the question was, well, you know, this character here, can we put this in the family tree because he's actually born in this book? And do we want to give that away? <laughs> I say, yes, you can give that away. I think that's probably fine. <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll still read the book. You know? So uh, yeah, that was, that was good, but it's uh, expanded in all kinds of different directions. And, uh, so, uh, so I think you're probably going to need a fold out by the time you get to. Yes. Well, I have I have several very ornamental uh, scrolls yes. of genealogy illustrated by uh, by uh, very artistic fans. Yes. There are a lot of uh, really artistic readers uh, who are inspired by the books to to do various things. There is a, a nice woman named Terry Biglands whose specialty is uh, costume design, and she has. Uh, done this fabulous ball gown uh, made of patchwork pieces. All of the blocks are handmade by her, illustrating various scenes from the books. And it is an 18th century ball gown uh, with you know, a beautiful uh, tartan jacket and so forth. Anyway, she's worn this to a number of uh, um, fantasy conventions and wizard worlds and things like that and wins awards. Well, she's in the process of making a new dress, which is totally fabulous. <laughs> she sends me pictures of all of her new quilt blocks and all that. So it's fascinating to see things come together because she sews the way I write in pieces <laughs> and then glues them together. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back, if I may, to, the, to how you do write. I, I remember at the start when you were first doing the interviews about the early books, you talked about the kilt factor. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, this all started essentially because, oh, that's what I was talking about, was how I started writing Outlander and, and why it's called Outlander. But uh, when I wanted to write a novel and did not know how, I said, well, you know, I've written comic books and uh, scholarly articles and software reviews. No one's ever told me how to write any of that. I just looked at a few and uh, wrote one, and if it didn't look quite right, I poked it until it did. So I said, I think the same must be true of writing novels. I've been reading novels for 30 odd years. Surely if I write one, I will recognize it. And so I said, okay, I think the best thing to do is write a novel. And that's all I can think of to do in order to actually learn what it takes in terms of organization and commitment and research and so forth to actually write a novel. So I said, fine, I'm gonna write a novel. What kind? Because I read everything and lots of it, maybe more crime fiction than anything else. So I thought maybe I'll write a mystery. And then I said, well, I don't know. I I'm, I'm, don't know if I can do plots or not. I'd better start with something simple. So I said, all right, uh, historical fiction. I was a, re a university research professor. I knew my way around a library, and I had access to the whole international library loan system. So I said, it seems easier to look things up than to make them up. And if I have no imagination, I can steal things from the historical record, <laughs> which actually works really well. And so I said, all right, uh, where shall I set this putative novel? And so I was thinking, well, you know, Venice under the Borgias, American Civil War, something dramatic and lots of action. And while I was wondering about this, I happened to see a really old Doctor Who rerun on public television. And you being British, I don't have to stop and explain who Doctor Who is, <laughs> which normally I would if we were in Italy, say. And uh, so it was one of the really old episodes uh, with Patrick Troughton as the second Doctor. And in this uh, show, he had picked up a young Scotsman from uh, 1745. And this was a young man who appeared in his kilt. And I said, well, that's kind of fetching. <laughs> <laughs> and I found myself still thinking about this the next day in church. And I said, uh, <laughs> I said uh, well, you know, you want to write a book. It really doesn't matter where you set it. The important thing is to make a point and get started. And so I said, fine, Scotland, 18th century. 
And so that's where I began, uh, having no plot, no outline, and no uh, characters, and knowing nothing about Scotland or the 18th century. All I had was this weather vague image of a man in a kilt, which <laughs> is, of course, a very powerful and compelling image, as you all know. <laughs> well, so um, that's where I started. Um, some years later, uh, I won an um, important international literary award called the Corina Award, and I uh, had to go to Germany to collect it. And while I was there, the German publisher had me interviewed by every journalist under the sun. And at the end of this, uh, I was talking to a nice man who was the editor of a literary journal. And he had read all the books and was very enthused about them. He was saying, well, your, your narrative uh, style is, is just transcendent. Your characters, they're just transfixing and so forth. And I'm thinking, yes, yes, go on. And uh, <laughs> then he said, there is this one thing, I wonder, could you explain to me, what is the appeal of a man in a kilt? <laughs> And I said, well, <laughs> I said, I suppose it's the idea that you could be up against a wall with him in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, trust there are no gentlemen wearing kilts in the audience at the moment. <laughs> we'll find out when the lights come up. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, I, I went home after this. And three weeks later, I get a stack of press clippings from this little jaunt. On top of it was the interview with this gentleman from the literary magazine. I recognized his name. And on top of it was a post-it note from the German uh, publisher. I can read German, but very slowly. It said, I don't know what you told this man, but I think he is in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> So evidently, the vision of a man in a kilt was enough to you know, start all of this. You know? <laughs> Although, sadly, from what you're saying, as the series has gone on, there are less men in kilts, mm. in, neither in America. Ah, well, I don't know. Um, there are still uh, many men in kilts in, in, well, in there, there are, yes. <laughs> yes, and I expect there to be in book, in book 10 as well which I would be writing if I wasn't here talking to you. <laughs> well, t t tell us about this, and tell us about this intriguing title. I, I gather it's a kind of bee, bee keeper's oh, term. Why about this title? Yeah, this title. Oh, right. Uh -huh. Well, this has to do with a uh, very popular custom of beekeeping. Um, many of you who keep bees might possibly know this, but especially in parts of Europe and the British Isles and uh, and of course, parts of Canada and the Americas as well. Uh, it is the custom for a beekeeper to talk to the bees. As you know, if you're a beekeeper, you need to visit your hives very frequently to make sure that they're not being attacked by wax moths or spiders or whatever, and to make sure that there is enough water and, and fresh forage for your bees and you know, take care of them generally. And uh, the custom goes that you must talk to the bees because bees are very social animals and they're interested in everything that goes on around them. They fly out and they, they gather news along with their pollen and nectar and bring it back to the hive. And so if you come to talk to them, you must tell them all your news. What's going on in your community? Has someone come to visit? Has a new baby been born? Has someone died or gone away? Because if something important happens and you don't tell the bees and they find out about it, they'll be angry with you and they'll swarm and fly away. So <laughs> you go and tell the bees if anything important has happened. But it has, it has various meanings in the novel. Mm -hmm. On yes, it has various applications, writing. depending on which character is, is being invoked, so to speak. But Claire is the one who's keeping bees, but, uh, so it's her talking to them frequently. But, you know, the next question is, who is it that's gone? When I told people this title, they were all saying, oh, no, Jamie's dead. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> did I say Jamie's dead? No, I said, go tell the bees that I am gone. Gone does not necessarily mean dead. And in fact, a lot of people go in this book and are not dead. <laughs> Uh, one or two are dead, but you know, nobody that you would care about that much. <laughs> what, <laughs> <laughs> what can you say about the book without giving too much away for people who haven't yet read it? I'm sure there are very few people here who have not yet read it, but what can you say about the book? Is it an immediate continuation of the last one, or have they moved oh, along a bit? Yes, it's pretty much a continuation of, of the last one, in that it deals with uh, sort of the rebuilding of Fraser's Ridge after the disruption caused by the fire and the burning of the big house and all that. So now uh, Jamie and Claire have come back from the disruption and the, the war of the regulation and Alamance and all the other things that have happened. 
and they are rebuilding. So the underlying metaphor behind the bees, uh, the bees being builders, of course, come into it, but Jamie is rebuilding his house. And as uh, Brianna says, when writing a letter to Lord John, she's describing how they have come back to the ridge, which they did at the end of the last book. So it's not a surprise that they should be in this book. But she's writing to him and she says, um, my father is building his own fortress, which in, in essence he is both internally and externally. And so this is the underlying uh, theme that runs through this is building this house and you know the, the things that attack them and, uh, and interfere with things, uh, the things that help them. Uh, new people come into the, into the ridge and uh, Jamie insists that the house must have a third floor, which was you know, sort of unthinkable back in the day, especially for something in the mountains of North Carolina. It's a big house, of course, uh, bigger than the last one, but he says it has to have a third floor because he says, you know, you've told me what's coming, you know, stuff is going to happen. I need to provide refuge. For his various, so, mm, tenants and things like that who might be dislocated by, by coming war. And um, that's kind of what he does. <laughs> while, you, while you're sorting your, your throat out. Um, yes. you, you, you've, on your website, you've got a little bit about how uh, the structure of novels or the shape of novels. Oh, yes. And you say that this one is a snake. This one is a snake. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, well, the story in this book uh, begins sort of what, what you might call a warning rattle, and then it uh, loops back and forth. We're dealing with several different storylines here because we have multiple characters of interest who are operating in different places. There's Lord John and his brother Hal and, uh, you know, the British Army sort of thing. Uh, there's Fergus and Marcelie who are running their newspaper on the coast and, you know, in danger of their own. There's Brianna and Roger who have just come back to the ridge uh, seeking shelter from a threat from the 20, 20th century. And so they're kind of dealing with that and also with relocating their, their little family, starting over. Roger is um, finding his vocation as a minister and beginning to realize just what that involves. As, uh, as Brianna says at one point here, um, she thought that he would just do the regular sorts of things that a minister does, you know, listen to people who are having trouble, marry people, bury people. She said she didn't realize that it meant going to battle and coming home with a stranger's shattered teeth in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually not funny, but <laughs> except that it is. No, yeah, <laughs> no. So anyway, we're following all of these different uh, different threads, and then of course there's there's Claire who is you know doing what she does. She and Jamie, you know, are kind of working in concert to you know preserve the things that they love, and so they're building and you know uh, gathering and foraging and so forth. And of course things happen along the way, but you see the story loop through these various storylines. There's young Ian. And we're returning to some things from the previous book. Um, young Ian uh, needs to clear things up with his first wife, Imohawk. And so he hears that there's been a massacre near where she lives. And he tells um, Rachel about it. And she says, well, of course, we have to go and see. And he says, we. And she says, if you think I'm going to let you go 700 miles to see your first wife, think again. <laughs> And so they go together, and that's yet another loop in the story because everybody comes back to the ridge. All these loops eventually lead back to the, to the ridge and to the house that's being built, finding it in a different stage at every, every turn. So that's our snake. It's sort of crawling through the, the, through the woods and through the structures and so forth. And uh, then the book kind of uh, comes up and bites you in the ass at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but is that something you said, and also you said that some of the earlier ones, they're geometric, or most of them are geometric. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that something you think about at the start as a structure, or, or is that when you look at it and see what you've no, that's done? That's just what I look at it in retrospect, and yeah. It, yeah. I seldom re recognize the structure until I'm about two thirds of the way through, and then I think, ah, <laughs> there it is. And then I look back and I say, yeah, that's what it is, all right. Yeah. And the other thing you've said is that you're, you're actually quite capable, more or less, of describing each novel in one word. Well, yes. Sometimes you cheat and do two <laughs> words. Or you say, yeah. well, I chose this one over that one. And yeah. this one is loyalty, I believe. Uh -huh. This is essentially loyalty. It could as easily be called betrayal, but I think that loyalty is, is the better word. Uh, more people in this are loyal than are betrayers. <laughs> and, and again, is that something that you look at after the, after the fact? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing, uh, well, actually, 
two questions about when you're writing. I mean, as we said, this is a very large family tree you've got here for Outlander. <laughs> it does. Does that mean it's getting more difficult to write it because you've got to keep in mind how you're going to get all these characters working? Well, yeah, that's what you'd call the technical aspect of, of doing what I do is the engineering, so to speak. And in fact, that's one of the important things that makes it take long, a long time to write one of these books. Part of it is the sheer size and the amount of research that goes into it. But a good bit of it is uh, the engineering, not only fitting the various storylines and managing the pacing from place to place, because this is what any writer does with a book, whether small or large, um, but also the problem that I'm addressing, which most writers don't have, is that it's a long time between books and they're very big books. And so, and they're very, luckily very popular books, thank you very much. But uh, the thing is, if uh, these books turn up in the first day of release in an airport bookshop, and they do because they are luckily uh, number one on the New York Times list. In fact, this book, and I th do thank you very much, was number one in all of the countries in which it's been released so far. <laughs> and, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that very much. Uh, but as I say, it does give me this peculiar problem because it shows up on the bestseller shelves. All right, many people passing through an airport or a bookshop, they immediately look at the bestseller list and they say, well, this is number one, it must be a good book, I'll take it. Never having heard of me and not knowing that there are eight enormous books that precede this. So they have to be able to understand enough of it to be able to enjoy this book. And that means that I need to recall to them the important points that have occurred in the earlier sorts of books. I need to reference the earlier parts of the story and do it uh, subtly enough that those of you who have been reading the whole thing will not be going, I already know this, what's going on, and be flipping pages. And at the same time, be attractive enough to the new reader that they will think, oh, that's fascinating. I must go and get that book too, and so forth. But uh, they have to be able to enjoy this book on its own terms. And to do that is a very delicate piece of engineering I call it jacquard weaving. That's a, a French technique where you have the warp and the weft and you're picking up threads uh, in a specific pattern so that the cloth appears to be the same, uh, you know, same color and same texture and all that. But if, and it looks flat if you look at it head on. If you look at it at a slight angle, the pattern that you have pulled up there will be visible. So that's what this, uh, what this is. If you are familiar with the story with luck, you won't notice the, the little bits of the pattern that I'm pulling up. Whereas if you're a new reader, you will notice them and you think, oh, fascinating and all that. So at least we hope so. But yeah, that is what makes it take quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you indicated that you, you have started Book Ted, and indeed on your website oh. there are little bits, there are little clips you can yeah. get, ha have a look mm -hmm. at, which is fun. Um, that's quite quick for you because obviously you spend a lot of time doing this. Oh. Um, and I know this came out in, in America in other territories a, a bit yeah. earlier than it, than it uh -huh. came out here, maybe. Um, well, actually, no, it came at the same time, didn't it? But that's a, a few months ago now, I understand. Yeah. So can you say how far along you are with Book 10? Uh, well, bear in mind, this book came out uh, two days before Thanksgiving last year. Yes. And in fact, uh, I had been writing it pretty much up to the end of August last year, uh, after which there was all of the uh, copy editing and so forth. The book uh, went to press the minute it left the copy editor. So uh, it was actually printed in late October. At this point, the local independent bookstore where I live called The Poison Pen asked me if what, well they'd asked me some months before, if they could advertise uh, pre-orders for signed first editions. I said, well, yeah, sure. So they uh, ordered 30,000 copies. <laughs> and, <laughs> there are risks to being popular. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this um, <laughs> involved them renting a small warehouse in the air park near where I live because you can't fit 30,000 copies of anything into a bookstore that size. And uh, so they also had to hire a number of very nice Sudanese immigrants to come and uh, do the, the heavy work, you know, opening the boxes, uh, you know, throwing the boxes. Um, stacking the books, inspecting the books for munged up covers and things like that, and then passing them to be piled up orderly on long tables and uh, flapped, which means uh, putting the front cover flap in at the title page so that when you open it, you're at the right page to sign it. And then the two most important people, the person who hands me the book to sign, they grab one off the pile, open it to the title page, put it in front of me at a 90 degree angle because I sign uphill. And that's important because if they had put it square in front of me, 
I have to turn it. And that's a loss of two seconds per book. And if you're dealing with 30,000 books, that's a lot of time. So, <laughs> this is a study in efficiency, believe me. So, and then the, the next person is the person who gets the book. So they hand it to me, I sign, and slam the cover shut and push it to the next person who then you know, puts it in one of several different boxes, depending on what sort of book it is and where it's going and all that. So uh, we did that for four hours a day, which is as much as I can sign. I can sign roughly 3,000 books a day in four, in four hours, maybe a little more um, at that rate with that, with that much help. Yeah, if I were doing it by myself, it would take, I'd still be doing it and not be here at all. Um, but uh, let's see, so, in addition- so How many do you think you've signed uh, in well, your lifetime? Oh, I wouldn't, I couldn't even begin to imagine. A but more than a book, million, yeah. I would think. Oh, uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. As for this book, in yeah. addition to those 30,000 know, actual books, uh, the American publisher before this had said, would you be willing to sign 17,000 tip sheets for us? You know, tip sheets are the title page with my signature, which then can be bound into the manuscript rather than actually being in the book. To a book collector, this makes a difference. <laughs> they, the tip sheet one is not uh, acceptable to them, whereas a book that has been whole when I signed it is. So uh, don't ask me why this is. I am not a book collector, but this is the case. So I was signing 17,000 copy or tip sheets for the Americans. The UK was much more modest. They only wanted 8,000. And uh, Canada, very obsequiously, asked for only 2,000. <laughs> so all told, I have signed my name 70,000 times for this book alone. But well, she's going to sign more today. She's going to sign more today. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I, think you, I think you've indicated that book 10 might be the last one. Well, I don't know. Um, oh, that's Well, good I news. mean, I, every time I write a book, I think it's the last one, and I've not been right so far, so I, I can't say for sure. Um, I don't know. I think book 10 is probably the last one. I, at the moment, I intend it to be the last one, but, you know, I, I just can't tell until I get there. I mean, I am 70 years old. I don't know how long I'm going to last, but, <laughs> but, you know, with luck long enough. Uh, luckily, the women in my family tend to live well into their 90s, you know, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've also, you've also said that, uh, that many years ago, you, you, you suddenly thought of the ending of the oh, series, yes. uh -huh. and you got up in the middle of the night, and you, mm -hmm. I don't want to set mass hysteria going here, but you got up in the <laughs> middle of the night, and you were, were crying your eyes out as you were writing this. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, There's it's nothing emotional. more you want to say, obviously, but <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be well, emotional. Are you still going to hold to that? Because that was a few years ago. Has it changed? Has that ending changed? No, no, I think that's still the ending. I mean, it is the ending. That's, <laughs> yeah. I knew it was the ending when I wrote it. That's why I was crying. <laughs> and I know, you, I know you're acquainted with and friends a bit with, uh, with George Martin, the, you know, the Game of Thrones <laughs> man. And he's had a terrible time because, of course, he couldn't write quickly enough. Mm -hmm. But you're in a rather better position, I understand, because Series 6, which is wonderful, yeah. is based on... I can't remember which number of the book it is. Oh, I know see. which one it is. Yeah, but I it's, think. it's mostly fiery, it's the ashes, well, fiery cross and echo in the bone. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the fifth and sixth, uh, sixth of the novels. So you think you're going to keep ahead of them, ahead of the TV series? So far, yes. <laughs> no, I firmly <laughs> expect to, uh, to beat them to the finish line. <laughs> I mean, uh, it takes a long time to film a television show. Not as long as it takes to write a book, but still quite a long time. And we are presently filming uh, season seven. Now, season seven is longer than usual because we had to truncate season six. It was originally intended to be 12 episodes and it ended being eight, partly because of the COVID epidemic, which slowed everything down everywhere, but also because Katrina was pregnant and didn't want to be working right up to her delivery date. And so they stopped with, uh, with episode eight. Uh, we did not lose those four episodes though. They were then attached to season seven, which will now have 16 episodes. And so they uh, filmed the first six and then uh, stopped for a six week break to let everybody relax and you know, and go home and you know, have a bath and things like that. <laughs> and, um, but I believe, I believe you wrote the, uh, the script for episode nine, which is, which is now kind of not oh, gonna yes. happen. Well, I did, uh, I did write of the, the script six. for episode 609, um, which, uh, well, it wouldn't have been a reasonably a reasonable opening episode. It worked where it was in the in the sequence of season six, 
uh, but it's not suitable for the opening episode of season seven. So what they did was take that, and they paid me for it, luckily, and then they uh, essentially <laughs> took it apart. So there are small pieces of that <laughs> in the first two or three episodes of season seven, but it's not, it's not extant as a single episode that I wrote. I did write one for season seven, but they haven't uh, got to filming that one yet. I hope and, to be back you, in Scotland when they and do. And you've done that before, I think you'd have, have series yeah. two or whatever. Yeah. Um, why, why do you do that? Why do you want to do that? Well, uh, it's so much easier than writing novels. <laughs> 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 well, also, it's a lot of fun, you know, to, uh, to write something and then see people perform it. You know, it's quite a thrill. Yeah. Which I believe you also, well, just quickly before I, I, I invite the audience uh, to uh, ask you questions, I believe that was the case with Laura Gray. You, you just, you wrote a couple of novellas, well, what you thought were novellas, uh, and suddenly your, your agents are saying, well, actually, these aren't novellas, these are mm. novels. They're just longer than, I mean, they're, they're no. the length of a normal <laughs> novel, not your novels. Are you still yes. enjoying doing the Lord Grey? Oh, yes. No, I enjoy Lord John. He always talks, to, he, he talks to me. He's live. And, you know, he kind of lives in a, in a constant state of conflict and imminent danger because, you know, he's a gay man in a time when that was a capital offense. You know, and he belongs to an aristocratic family. If, uh, if he goes down, his whole family is going to be ruined as well. So, you know, uh, he has a great, uh, a great deal at stake pretty much all of the time. And then again, there's Jamie Fraser, with whom he is in love, but whom he is actually, you know, has no chance of, of uh, having reciprocation, save in the form of respect and friendship, which he values, but you know, still. <laughs> And, and you've, you've mooted the fact that you might one day write a book about Master Raymond. Oh, yeah. Dates from 400 BC and is this small mm -hmm. apothecary. Yeah. Is that still somewhere on your on your? Oh, yes. Cards? Yeah, no, Master Raymond is still uh, bubbling away back in the back chambers of the mind. I have small pieces of his book that just pop to the surface every once in a while, and I write them down. So I, I know a great deal about him and, uh, you know, the, at least the beginnings of his story and so forth. So, you know, uh, along the way, at the moment, though, I'm working not only on book 10, but also on a prequel book, which is about Brian and, uh, and Ellen, uh, Jamie yeah. Fraser's parents. We know the opening start of their story because uh, Jamie told it to Claire in Outlander. But, uh, of course, there's a lot more to tell, especially as the first part of their story took part during uh, the Jacobite Rising of 1715. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the 45 was just the end of the Jacobite Rising. It had, there was one in 1708, 1715, and then again in 1719. So uh, their story is woven in with that as well. And there's a lot of clan politics and other interesting things. So, yes, I'm writing that one. Uh, now, Sony and Stars, who are the entities that, uh, that uh, do the show, yeah. are also interested in doing a prequel. Uh, they are in talks, as they say, or rather in development, which means that they have gone so far as to invest a certain amount of money in having, you know, like a trial script written and, uh, you know, uh, see what that looks like and before they go ahead and uh, green light it, which would mean committing enough money to actually shoot a whole season. Yeah. That's a great deal of money, so they're very careful about it. So at the moment, it is just in development. However, um, I had written uh, a um, three-page summary of, uh, or synopsis, of what I conceive to be the beginning of, well, most of the book um, about Jamie and uh, Jamie's parents. And I gave them that to be, you know, sort of working off of, which they're doing. And uh, meanwhile, I will show them the pieces of the book that I'm writing and they can use what, uh, what they can use. So we'll see how that works. But yes, they, uh, this is all assuming that that show does get greenlit. We don't know that yet. But, you know, if it does, I will certainly be involved in it. <laughs> well, I think that's thrilling news. You've been very patient with me, but let's get some questions from the audience. Uh, when, if we can have the lights up, um, there's going to be a couple of people in the middle aisle here and also in the side aisles up there with microphones. Mm. Uh, if you've got a question, stick your hand in there. There's somebody there already. Um, but I'm, I'm going to take the first question, if I can get this to work, uh, from online, I hope. <laughs> oh, yes, here we go. Oh, a few questions. So why should, why should get in the microphones where they need to be? Let me just ask a question from online. Uh, oh, there has not yet been a translation of the Outlander books into Scots Gaelic or Scots. Well, would true. you be supportive of such an initiative? Oh, I would, yes. I only know of one or two uh, Gaelic publishers and they're very small houses, though. They might not be up to a financial commitment <laughs> of that size. Well, yes. And just one more from here. 
if you could meet just one of the characters from Outlander in person and take them for dinner, who would you meet? <laughs> What, you all know the answer to that question, do you? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. There is a local group of fans who take me out to tea periodically to pick my brains about what's going on. And on one of these occasions, some years ago, they got started on the character of Black Jack Randall. They're going, oh, he's so loathsome, he's so disgusting, he makes my skin crawl. And I'm sitting there sipping my Earl Grey and thinking, you have no idea you're talking to Black Jack Randall, do you? <laughs> I mean, uh, he's me, you know, who else would he be? And, uh, you know, I'm all of them. You know, I don't have to take them to dinner. <laughs> 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 okay, who have you got here? Yeah, okay. Hi, Diane. Hi. I hope you can see me. I'm five foot and this is my full height. Um, welcome back to Edinburgh. Thank you. I'm a storytelling tour guide on the Royal Mile. Oh, wonderful. And uh, thank you for everything you've done for the Scottish tourism industry. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after the two years we've all had. But there's one particular story that I love telling, which is relates to Charles Dickens, and oh. a great storyteller. He visited Edinburgh in 1841. And he went to the Canongate Kirkyard, uh -huh. and he was looking around its twilight, and there was a gravestone that he noticed, and he misread it. It was for a man who'd been the Lord Provost, and he was a meal man, a man who dealt in grain and all that kind of thing. But Dickens re misread that, this as a mean man, Ooh. and he was really worried and thought, how awful to be remembered for being a mean man. <laughs> and out of that came Ebenezer Scrooge, because the man's <laughs> name was Ebenezer Scroggy. Ah. <laughs> so I was wondering if you've had any happy accidents where you've picked something up and it's been turned around and you've used it in a book. Oh, probably, but uh, you know, nothing comes immediately to my mind. But yeah, I just uh, pick up scraps and bits and pieces of all kinds of things. And sometimes I will use something deliberately differently than it actually <laughs> occurred. And other times it's just, uh, it's just there. Other times I do know what I'm doing, but uh, people who read it don't, which is why I have the author's notes in the back. So for instance, uh, there is a word, uh, curd, C-U-R-D, and you can get lemon curd for your dessert and things like that. Well, and I don't know if it's still the case in Scotland, but in the 18th century, that was pronounced crud, C-R-U-D, <laughs> which means something completely different in America. <laughs> and so being um, you know, officiously um, explicit in my books, I uh, let the Scots uh, be having creamed crud for their dessert, <laughs> causing any number of people to write to me and tell me it's a type of Graphical error. <laughs> like, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so there's uh, there's things like that, but I can't think of anything that I have you know totally mistaken and and used effectively. I'm I'm sure there's things I've totally mistaken, but I don't know whether I've used them right or effectively. Although as you know, we're familiar with Scrooge McDuck, thanks to you. Oh yes. So, <laughs> question there, yeah. Hi there. Hi. Can I just give you a professional thanks as well as a Scottish medium? Um, Americans love Scottish history, and the, Scottish, the American spiritualist movement absolutely love Scotland because of our historical um, strength, like witchcraft, for example. We have mm. the highest number per capita of executions of witches. The last medium to be jailed in the UK was jailed under the Witchcraft Act. So did you do any research into any of that for the spiritual elements in the books? Yes, quite a bit. Uh, with regard to the witchcraft and so forth, I was uh, writing Outlander and I said to my husband that I was rather upset because I wanted to have a witchcraft trial in this, but I said that I've been looking it up and the last uh, witch to be uh, executed, for, executed for witchcraft was uh, executed in 1722, you know, and I'm working in like 1743, which my husband looked at me and he uh, said, uh, this book you're writing, it's fiction, right? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, so you expect people to believe in time travel, but you're worried that your witches are 12 years too late. <laughs> I said, well, you have a point. <laughs> so, uh, so we just you know, fiddled that one. <laughs> <laughs> there's somebody over there, and then I know there's somebody over there. So the yep. person up there first, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Diane, I'm a huge fan of your books. Uh, oh, thanks. Really amazing. Um, Peter, you touched on, and Diane, you spoke about how your later book got more complex with the number of characters. I'm wondering if you could go back to your earliest book and kind of the research process you took and how you decided 
you know, which storyline and keeping all those facts and which parts of history you were going to touch on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it seems very complex from the very beginning. How did you kind of manage that first book, if you could talk a little? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you, a uh, story comes down essentially to two things. Who is this character that you're writing about? You know, who are they and what do they want? Every story is driven by that, you know. Um, my son is a successful fantasy author on his, on his own. His name's Sam Sykes, that's what he writes under. He's got a new book coming out in December, watch for it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, but, you know, I talk writing with him periodically and you know, every once in a while I'll come and say, well, I'm having trouble with this scene, you know. I, I've been struggling with it for three days and I just don't know what's wrong with it. I know what I want to happen, but it's not, it's not coming alive. And I said, well, you know, uh, tell me about it. And I said, oh, you've got uh, two different characters and you're telling it from this person's point of view. Try turning it around and telling it from the other person's point of view. It might be their scene, you know, because they want something that this scene is, is being driven by. And that almost always works. If you're stuck with something, find out who is this character and what do they want. Uh, and so that's uh, sort of the motivation for pretty much everything that happens in that book, is what do these people want? But that, of course, is affected by the, the, the research setting, you know, by what's happening in the larger world as well as in their personal lives. And, you know, history is full of, you know, entertaining things and the action and whatnot. I personally love battles, and so I, I, I look for battles when I'm going through the history. I'm thinking, yeah, I want that one, yeah. Uh, and uh, so it, I like it not only because it is, you know, action and conflict and, you know, great stakes and so forth, but because I get to walk battlefields, which is uh, a very deeply spiritual exercise as well. Um, but you can, uh, you can feel what happened on a battlefield. So the research is driven, you know, partly by what actually happened and the fact that you need to at least be realistic with regard to what did happen. And of course, there'll be pieces where you don't know what happened, but you can guess or you can invent things and that's much more elastic. So the research is driven partly by facts, but also partly by what appealed to me. Somebody over there, yeah. I, I was wondering if there was one small char like a kid character that you could meet, which would it be? A small, a small character? A small character, did you say a small like character? Like a kid. Oh, like a kid. kid. <laughs> I can't imagine why you're asking that question, but. <laughs> Ro Robbie actually plays Jermaine in, well. in, in, in the series. Well, well, let me see. Is there a kid a character that I would like to meet? Um, well, again, I have to be all of them too, but I'm particularly fond of uh, Mandy McKenzie. She is, uh, as her grandfather describes her, a feisty wee baggy, and thus very fun to write. <laughs> is there another one somewhere? I can't see. Oh, up, have you got one up there? Yeah, there oh, sorry, I couldn't see yeah. you up there. Carry on. Hello, Diana. Hi. Obviously, during your book, you wrote a little bit about Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, mm -hmm. and obviously, this little building here is one you may have passed on the way to the mausoleum. Ah. We are 100 yards in front of it. Mm -hmm. It's just been renovated to a five-star luxury let. Is it really? Oh my, congratulations. And we know that you're coming up to Inverness, <laughs> but we've came down here today to invite you to come and stay. Oh. <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much. Next time I'm in town, I will look you up. <laughs> you don't mind, I'll pass one on. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's very naughty of you. I get it. <laughs> thank you. Let's take another question online, and I'll come to those as well. Okay. Um, has a character ever done something that really disappointed you, took your story in a completely different direction from what you thought, and you've had no control over it? Oh, that really doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know I one of those who slowly. says, my characters take control. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, sometimes they do, but that doesn't disappoint me. I'm always pleased when they take the burden off my shoulders. You know, I'm thrilled. <laughs> uh, if, they, if they're going somewhere, they have a reason, you know, so I just follow them. <laughs> sometimes this causes complications because they will you know, suddenly leave in the midst of something and then I have to figure out what happened next. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's great when a character, you know, sort of... Mm, it doesn't become separate from me, but you know, but they do things that I don't have to consciously. Although think Claire about. did at the start, didn't she? Mm, oh yeah. Claire didn't obey. You know, she. Suddenly oh no! To yeah, start. I think that's the first and last time I ever struggled with a character <laughs> because I had no idea. But no, uh, 
I started with the men and the kilt, but you know, nothing else. And so on the third day of writing, I said, well, I think I should have, uh, I must have a lot of men because of the kilt factor, but I think it would be a good idea <laughs> if I had a woman to play off these guys, then we'll have sexual conflict, that's good. And so I said, well, given that it was Scots versus English, roughly speaking, um, if I make her an English woman, we will have lots of conflict. And so I introduced this English woman, sent her into a cottage full of Scotsmen to see what she'd do. And uh, they were all crouched by the fire muttering and they turned around and stared at her. And I was thinking, why does she look odd? What's going on? Anyway, one of them drew himself up and he said, my name's Dougal Mackenzie, and who might you be? And without my stopping to think, I just said, my name is Clara Elizabeth Beecham, and who the hell are you? <laughs> and, uh, I said, well, you don't sound at all like an 18th century person. So, you know, I fought with her for several pages, trying to beat her into shape and make her talk like an 18th century woman. She was not having any of this. She just started making smart-ass remarks about everything she saw and being modern about it. And I said, well, I'm not going to fight with you all the rest of the way through this book. Go ahead and be modern. I'll figure out how you got there later. So it's all her fault that <laughs> there's time travel in these books. <laughs> Question over there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh. Aya, um, for many people around the world, um, your books are the first encounter they have with kind of Gallic culture, um, but what has the reception been like from kind of the Gallic community to your stories? Uh, they're very enthused about it, thank you. Um, and partly, well, I, I, I hope part of it is due to the, <laughs> the story itself, but much more because it has apparently incited a uh, sort of a renaissance of, uh, of the Gaelic language. Yeah, when I uh, first started writing these books, I realized from research that back in the day, in the Gael Tag, the, uh, they spoke Gaelic, of course. And so I wanted to have that as, a, you know, uh, as accuracy and, and atmosphere as well. But I did not have anybody in Phoenix, Arizona in 1988 who spoke Gaelic. So I was uh, forced to look for books about it. There weren't any. So I finally tracked down a very small Gallic English dictionary from a place called Steinhoff's Foreign Books in Boston. <laughs> this was well before the internet. So I called them up one day and said, I'm looking for a Gallic dictionary. And they immediately said, Scottish Gallic or Irish Gallic? And I said, ah, <laughs> I found you. And so they sent me this <laughs> nice little book, which I used for the Gallic in, uh, in the first two books. At the conclusion of this, I got a, a nice letter from a gentleman named Ian McKinnon Taylor, who said, you know, I've been reading your books and it's wonderful to see, you know, the, the history of Scotland so wonderfully, and his people so wonderfully described, and your stories are wonderful. Uh, he said, I was born on the Isle of Harris. He said, and uh, I am a Gaelic speaker. I hesitate to uh, criticize, but I think you must be getting your Gaelic from a dictionary. <laughs> 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 he said, it's not necessarily that you're using the wrong words, but you're not using them uh, grammatically or idiomatically in the way that an actual uh, Gaelic speaker would. And he said, you know, I, um, I feel hesitant about offering my, my uh, expertise, so to speak, but I would be more than happy to translate Gaelic for you. And I wrote back and said, where have you been all my life, Mr. Taylor? And, uh, <laughs> so uh, Ian very kindly did the translations for me up through Fiery Cross. And at that point, his wife developed health problems and he was not, not able to do it for me anymore. But I have uh, since uh, found uh, several Gaelic speakers and uh, as they modestly style themselves, Gaelic learners who uh, uh, do help me with this. One of them is Kathy McPhee, who is a, a Gaelic speaker from Barra and a, pre a TV presenter and so forth. <laughs> I said this to a, a, a Inverness uh, audience once and, uh, and <laughs> said, I don't know whether you can tell the difference between a Gaelic speaker from Barra and one from you know, uh, Inverness. And everybody burst into laughter and said, oh, yes, we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> So there are definitely regional variations and things like that. But the thing is, when Mr. Uh, Taylor approached me and so forth, and we'd, we embarked on this, he said that he was, you know, delighted to have this chance, you know, to uh, to promote Gaelic, as it were. He said that he was afraid that Gaelic would be a, a dead language in 15 years. And. Uh, I wrote back and I said, well, I tell you what, Ian, if it is, it's not because you and I didn't try. Oh. <laughs> We're running out of time, so we, there's a question up there, there's one over there, and there's one down here. I'm going to try and squeeze them all in. All Please right. keep your questions very short, if you don't mind. 
Okay, yeah, so um, my question is why you chose to write Outlander in the first person, just because it's not always in the genre for that to be first person, and also your other works, obviously like Scrooge McDuck, you're not writing in the first person per se. <laughs> so I was just curious why you chose that narrative plot. Because Claire was telling the story. <laughs> okay, that question up here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Diana. Hi. Um, People come to Scotland, uh, if I could go back to tourism, people come to Scotland for many, many reasons. And how do you feel being the person, in my opinion, the person responsible for increasing Scottish tourism by, oh, hundreds and thousands of people? Um, it, the Outlander series has been incredible. And uh, how do you feel being the most important person to bring more people to Scotland than the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> you should have started with your last line, actually. But yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was talking to a journalist who said, uh, you've gotten more Scotsmen laid than the kilt. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, well, I feel kind of odd, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of hard to grasp, you know, just the, the, the immensity of this, but I'm yeah, very honored. Okay, and this, yeah, just, I think this is going to have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, I'm so honored. <laughs> Dan, it's lovely to have you here. Um, thank you so much for all you do and for bringing us Jamie Fraser. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> My question is, um, how do you reconcile the differences in the books to the series? Um, one thing in particular that I'm thinking of is when Jacinta and Rulisis, I think I've seen that right, um, went to Canada, and in the, the, the storyline in this TV series, um, Rulisis went to England with Lord John. Now, not to give too much away, but he's come back in Go Tell the Beast I'm Gone, and it's quite a big shift in his character. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have any influence in how that will be portrayed when they do come round to filming that? Well, yes and no. They show me all of the scripts and uh, they show me all of the footage and so forth. And, you know, I do tell them, you know, well, this happens. And, and sometimes I say, well, you maybe don't want to do that because in the next book, you know, this ha is going to happen and all that. And sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. That's basically what it comes down to. Uh, but, you know, they, they try. The bottom line is that these are very big books and they have a very limited amount of time in which they can do things. And uh, also for an episode, it's kind of a a circular arc for each episode, and that's not the way the books are structured at all. So they have to take them apart and kind of put the pieces back together in a different way. Likewise, they need to skip over some very large parts, which leads to dislocations like the one you mentioned. And sometimes it's just a matter of budget. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure if that's a good place to end, oh, but yeah. certainly that is where we, where we have to end. I'm sorry for anybody who, who didn't get their question asked. Um, can I ask you, just before I ask you to thank Diana, uh, to stay in your seats when we leave the stage so that I can get Elvis out of the building into the, other, into the signing room <laughs> so she's waiting for you with her pen poised uh, to sign books. Thank you for being such an attentive and entertaining audience and, and uh, being such good fun. Will we please thank for a fantastic hour, Danny Gavaldon.